Joining us now on the Oakland County Megacast is Mark Navin. He is a PhD and professor and chair of philosophy at Oakland University and a lecturer in the medical studies, Oakland University, William Beaumont. So great to have you on with us. Thank you for joining us on the Monday edition of the Oakland County Megacast. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Ronnie. So many questions. So I'm sure you saw the news coming out that uh, yet another vaccine um, is in the works and it looks like it's going to actually happen. Can we talk about the ethics surrounding some of the vaccines? And it's funny because my husband and I were having the conversation yesterday. Will people be willing to get the vaccine? Because there are a lot of people out there, parents, who um, don't believe in vaccines. So can the government make you get a vaccine? Well, great. So as you note, there are so many ethics issues. And maybe as we get started, it's worth sort of distinguishing some, and then we can circle back on those that, that you're interested in talking about. But, but even in your question there, there's two different questions. One is uh, ethics around acceptance, right? And so surely the government has an obligation uh, to protect us by, by uh, sponsoring and purchasing and distributing the vaccine, right? Uh, in, uh, improving availability and access and also awareness, but also they have an obligation to promote acceptance. And so, so what should we be doing better, right, as individuals and in our communities and through our government to promote acceptance? That's, that's a real important ethics issue. But then, as you know, related to acceptance is what happens when that fails? What happens when we don't do enough to promote acceptance? What kinds of power uh, can the government use, either kinds of hard power by making refusal illegal or uh, limiting our liberties or uh, in various ways, our access to public spaces like schools or businesses? Um, and what sort of power can private actors do, right? Businesses or hospitals do if their workers refuse. So I think you're right, huge ethics issues there. And more generally, there are a bunch of ethics issues surrounding um, the sort of differences between the vaccines. And happy to talk about the three major players right now, right? The Pfizer, uh, the Moderna, and the AstraZeneca, which are, are each really distinct. And, and the, the two um, you know, uh, mRNA ones, that the Pfizer and, and the, the Moderna vaccines, are going to present unique challenges uh, for cold storage that, that are going to intersect with some of the ethics issues about reaching the communities that are most vulnerable and, and sometimes most in need of the vaccine. Yeah, I'm really surprised um, with that. Why is one vaccine not require that, but the others do? And will that then make um, a, the vaccine that doesn't require the cold storage a more popular way for some of these governments to go? Uh, yeah, and it's, it's trade-offs all over, right? So there's all kinds of uncertainty. Ordinarily, we'd be waiting, but now we're talking about in December 10th for the FDA's committee uh, to make a, a, what, an emergency use authorization. Now, the word emergency is there because they don't normally skip all the steps they're skipping, and there are risks involved in that. And we're all very excited, right, to see the Pfizer vaccine that's on the, the docket for December 10th to, to get approved for emergency use. But but there are, there are risks we don't know what the long-term uh, risks associated with that vaccine are going to be, especially because it uses a novel technology uh, of introducing RNA into the body to use the body's own cells uh, to generate the antigen that creates the immune response. So it, it, maybe a tiny bit of science here is, is helpful. So traditionally what vaccines do is they use a part so, uh, of a path, so a pathogen are the things that get you sick, virus, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, worms, right? So those are the things that get you sick, those are the nasties. And how do vaccines work? Will they take a part of a pathogen that's either dead or inactivated, or they just actually cut a little piece of it and put it in the body and create an immune response with that, right? So they, they put something called the antigen in the body, which creates the immune response. RNA vaccines are so exciting because you don't have to take any part of the pathogen. There's no piece of the virus or bacteria put in people's bodies. You just put in a little bit of this DNA RNA code that works with the body's own cells to create the antigen and the immune response itself. Now that is some fancy science stuff that, that we've done before with some other vaccines, but RNA is really vulnerable. Uh, and so, especially with the Pfizer vaccine, it's especially vulnerable. It has to be kept at 70 degrees, negative 70 degrees Celsius. It's colder than winters in Antarctica, as people have been saying. Uh, and, and they're promising that combinations of dry ice and short-term storage and like hospital, you know, deep cold storage is gonna work. But those, those challenges are really hard, which is one reason to be so excited about the new Oxford AstraZeneca announcement, because they're using a more traditional way of making vaccine. They're using a sort of part of the virus, a part of the pathogen to create the immune response. And those uh, vaccines traditionally just require normal refrigeration, 
which is so much easier to provide, not just through hospitals and big institutions, but even at local doctor's offices. But one of the things I find interesting too, though, is a lot of these vaccines, it's a two dose process. So you're looking at, if we're looking at trying to do millions and millions of people, does that present a different sort of challenge? And how many people will actually go back for that second dosage? There's so much uncertainty, uh, as you say. And in fact, the, the preliminary results, which is all we have on these vaccines, are in some ways odd because they're so preliminary and the data is so small. So for example, the, the very exciting new Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that we're seeing preliminary data on, they actually showed strangely a better response on one dose than on two doses. Now that's almost certainly an artifact of having small numbers, but you're right that it matters whether the vaccine is going to require two doses, right, versus one, uh, and how easy it's going to be to get and when we're going to be able to get it. America is very lucky as like one of the wealthiest countries in the world. We've bought up a huge chunk of the world's supply. I was just writing it down, right? So we've purchased 300 million doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca, 100 million of the Moderna, 100 million of the Pfizer, 100 million of the Johnson & Johnson still in development, 100 million of the Sanofi uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and a bunch of other ones too. We bought almost a billion doses as a country because what's really cool about these, these vaccines is they've been making them as they've been testing them because they've been crossing their fingers that it works and that if it gets approval, then they'll be ready to sell them. And that is not normally how this works. You normally make sure you've got it you know, it works in the lab, then you, you make it, but they've been making them as they go. And, and so that's one reason why we're so excited to get started once we can sort of jump through these sort of approval processes and deal with these really tricky ethics, distribution, allocation, acceptance, you know, mandate political questions. Professor yeah. Nathan, with, with that, where does that balance come into play the, the, then philosophically, ethically, and scientifically as they're preparing this vaccine potentially, or these vaccines potentially for distribution, knowing that there are so many risks with fast tracking this process that you normally take several years and instead it's taken several months, but also because the need is so great that it, sh that it really has to be fast tracked. Where does that balance meet to a point where it is most opportune and a safe bet to some extent to green yeah. light a vaccine? I mean, and and the, this is a great question. And the difficult part is that the certainties are all on one side of the equation and the uncertainties on the other side. So we know, right, as Ronnie was saying in the previous segment, uh, that women disproportionately are exiting the workforce. We know this is bad for kids, especially kids uh, whose parents aren't allowed to throw tons, aren't able to throw tons of resources at them in a kind of homeschooling environment. Uh, we know that this is horrible for the elderly and especially for people in long-term care facilities. We know just looking at the death and, and the, and the, the uh, morbidity associated with this disease, that's 100% certainty. We know that's going to continue and get worse. On the other side, we've got some really good evidence um, that some of these vaccines work, at least in the short to medium term. We've got good evidence that in the short to medium term, the risks of complications are you know, very low. We've got good evidence that the cold storage works but in the short to medium term. But again, we don't know. I mean, I, I can tell you how long I can keep ground beef in my freezer. We actually don't know how long you can keep this vaccine in the freezer because we haven't kept it in the freezer that long yet. Uh, there's so much uncertainty, yet against the certainties of the bad, right, of, of the status quo, and that the probabilistic information about the good of the vaccine, then this, the lurking issue is the uncertainties about the bad of the vaccine. And, and we don't know. Um, we really don't. But a, a lot of people, and, and me included, think that these are reasonable risks to take. Uh, but there are risks. There's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, and with that, we have parents that already don't want to get their kids vaccinated with the standard vaccinations. So how do you put this into play if it's going to be required, an in instance, if uh, it's going to be required by a school district for their kids to come back to school? So there are going to be those discussions and topics, I think, going forward, government versus parent um, responsibility. The short answer is it's very premature to worry about that because in the short period, it's going to be uh, accessibility and availability of the vaccine that we worry about. So everyone's talking, oh, December 11th, we can start having this Pfizer vaccine. That's going to be a small amount of doses at hospitals. Uh, and even after then, uh, at least following the Michigan COVID-19 vaccine allocation plan, it's going to be local health departments prioritizing which providers are serving disproportionately elderly or long-term care facility people or uh, people who are otherwise medically vulnerable. It's going to be easily summer, maybe late spring, 
before sort of ordinary healthy folks are even going to have reliable access to this vaccine. And, and so I think that's a nice window in which we as a society can both sort of learn more about risks, but also be promoting acceptance, right? Be normalizing this behavior. So I, look, I can't blame anyone for saying I'm reluctant to do something no one's done yet. Right? It takes kind of, I mean, not everyone has the personality where they want to be the first person to do it. But once 20%, 30, 40% of the population's gotten this vaccine, let's see if we can shift these social norms. Let's see if as a community, right, we can make this a regular normal thing and, and maybe reduce that anxiety. And then if there's 15% of the population left that's resistant, then we'll look at targeted, you know, uh, persuasive uh, campaigns from government and from, uh, but then, you know, coercion is always on the table. But I, I think that's, that's a last resort. No, no reason to talk about it yet. <laughs> well, and you're looking at this and a lot of people are concerned because they're like, this is being pushed. This is being pushed through the process. So yep. there is questions about how safe is it or is this um, being rushed too soon? Because this process before a pandemic never would have happened like this. Of course not. Yeah. I mean, but but here are the certainties. And, and here's another question about who is going to take it first. So I've got friends and, and acquaintances, perhaps you do, too, that that work in hospitals. And and this is the underreported story of our time. These people are are drowning. Um, they are they are physically being sick and dying, and they are physically and emotionally, psychologically just exhausted. Uh, and our systems in the next week or two in here in Michigan are likely to break down. We are we are very close to being out of ICU beds, but that that's a misnomer. What we're really getting close to being out of is ICU nurses. Uh, we're the shortage. Last time we were worried about was ventilators. We're worried about now about about, about healthcare staff. And that line of, of cases and hospitalizations is going straight up. And with Thanksgiving coming the way it's going to come, is going to go straight up for the next few weeks. Those people, I guarantee, those nurses and doctors are going to take, when they're offered the vaccine and they're going to get a chance to get it first, I guarantee they're going to take it. Because you're right, there's some risks, but their certainty that they're dealing with right now is so horrible uh, that, that they need that vaccine. And, and I also... I can't guarantee or speak for, for people in long-term care facilities, but I imagine grandparents who haven't seen their grandkids or almost anybody in eight or nine months um, and only have you know so many years left to live, they're going to prioritize being able to see people over you know some unknown risks of some longer-term thing happening. But you're right. I, I, I think here's, here's the other issue. For healthy people, especially healthy young people, especially for people making decisions for their kids, it's not about your own kids, right? If I, my decision to vaccinate my kids in general, but especially with this vaccine, is not about their health. It's about the health of other vulnerable people in the community. It's about people's grandparents and, and ill people. And so we as a society do a really bad job of talking about our, uh, our choices in terms of helping other people and protecting other people from harm. But we're gonna need to talk that way about COVID-19 because very few kids actually get serious symptoms uh, from this disease. But the reason to vaccinate kids against it is going to be protect old people. But you're right, like, why would I risk things for my kid to help other people? And, and so we're going to need to assuage those worries about risks before we hit spring and summer and, and the vaccines are rolling out to healthy kids. You know, what's so fascinating about that is because we're talking about a vaccine, but yeah, we're having those discussions and debates in public right now over wearing a mask. And that's nothing that's going into your system it's just wearing a mask. Yeah, I mean, I want to shake my head with you. Uh, I mean, I, I worry um, about the, the intense politicization of public health measures that used to be consensus. Uh, and, and not that everything is about Trump, but uh, things have gotten worse recently. And, um, you know, it's, it's fun to wave our flag when it's our sports team. And, and even in politics under normal times, it's fun to have our team and our tribe that we're rooting for. But when it's common sense public health measures that are keeping people alive and helping to keep our economy going, and you know, the only way to go back to work and go back to school is if we don't have a raging pandemic and masking and social distancing and vaccines is the only way to solve that problem. I, it's, a, it's the biggest disaster possible for that to be politicized. And I, I don't know how you get out of that. And on the other side of that, um we're looking at some doctors that don't allow or don't accept patients if their parents aren't willing to vaccinate their kids. I know you recently worked on a paper regarding that topic. Do you want to expand on that as well and how this new COVID-19 vaccine could play into this discussion as well? 
Yeah, I, th I think it's related to my, my sort of previous statement that I worry that um, when what used to be common sense public health measures get politicized, um, people tend to, to dig in and, and, and come further apart. And, and so I've, I've written in other contexts about, I'm not just worried about anti-vaccine people and anti-mask people, but I'm worried about the anti-anti-vaccine people. I'm worried about people that now are sort of angry and want to punish and like, you know, separate themselves from the anti-vaccine people. And, and one, one place I see that is, is in primary care, especially in pediatrics. Uh, the pediatricians uh, increasingly are uh, dismissing or refusing to accept families unless they agree to receive all the recommended vaccines, uh, even though the most refused, commonly refused vaccine is for chickenpox, which is serious, but it's not polio. Uh, and, and so I've written and others have written that even though this is what doctors want often, uh, this is not actually what's best for kids and it's not what's best for public health and uh, continuing to, to sort of engage with and educate and persuade um, families is, is our only hope, even though it's, it's often a long shot. Mark Navin with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He is a PhD professor and chair of philosophy at the Oakland University and lecturer in the uh, medical studies at the Oakland University, William, o uh, William Beaumont. Um, with that, there, I just think this must be a fascinating time for someone in your profession facing so many of these issues. What is the conversation going to be for you and your family around the Thanksgiving dinner? <laughs> well, it's going to be a small dinner this year. It's just uh, my wife and I and our three kids. And, and you know, my parents uh, and, and my wife's family live out of town, and we usually either travel or come together. And weeks ago, we decided that, that it just wasn't going to work. Uh, that those risks, especially to our grandparents, were, were not, um, you know, they were not low enough. They were too high, right? And, and so therefore willing to, to make the sacrifice. Uh, I mean, I think for my family, uh, I'm not as worried about the risks. Uh, I'm, I'm part of that is I'm just very pro-vaccine to begin with. Uh, and and the, the studies we've seen show like basically no serious short and, and midterm uh, results of these vaccines. Um, and, and in fact, the RNA vaccines, which maybe sounds scary to people, are actually safer than the vaccines we traditionally have because no, no viral materials are actually ever in your body. And this RNA, once it sort of creates the antigen, dies instantly. So like the, the thing you've injected actually goes away almost immediately once you've put it in the body. I mean, there's a chance for, even though vaccines already are super safe, these are, if they work and they look like they work, going to be the safest vaccines we've ever had. Yeah, can we talk a little bit about how this conversation really even got started about with the anti-vaccinator uh, um, parents? Uh, I know there was a, some people that believed back in the day that it was the vaccines that were required were associated with um, autism and other side effects such as that. Is there any validity to those arguments? Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, the most studied and over-researched topic uh, in um, uh, in vaccines and maybe even science is that vaccines are not associated with autism, right? It, both in sort of experimental, quasi-experimental and observational studies, no, no relationship at all. That being said, I, I want to frame the question a little bit differently, which is that um, we shouldn't be surprised to see anti-vaccine people. In fact, we should be surprised to have seen the long decades of consensus that vaccines are great because vaccines are fundamentally weird. I'm pro-vaccine. All my kids are fully vaccinated. Heck, I, I volunteer or work at the hospital, and so I, I went and got my MMR uh, redone because my titers were low. I love vaccines, but they're weird. That They are injecting healthy children with antigenic material in order to protect them against diseases they haven't gotten yet. We don't do other stuff like that. And, and so I think it requires um, decades of cultural buy-in and socialization to get people to think that this is a non-issue. And so it's not so much that, oh, the anti-vaxxers came out of nowhere, but that we have failed in our social, political, religious, interpersonal institutions to continually regenerate, because it's every generation's task, right, to recultivate our trust in our institutions and in these fundamental practices of social cooperation. And we've, we've broken down, and you see that failure and that breakdown of institutions everywhere. And so it's no surprise that, that the vaccine um, um, sort of consensus has fallen apart, much the way other kinds of consensus have fallen apart in this country. So is the COVID-19 pandemic an opportunity to try to reframe the conversations? I hope so. Uh, the, I mean, the problem is 
Uh, so this here's an, a couple problems. So, so one problem is it's such a discrete thing uh, that so, so so you see, for example, the last week, some of the Republican governors reversing themselves on mask mandates. They've said, OK, it's gotten bad enough. I've changed my mind. Even if it's the case that they've really come around after the pandemic, what remains? I don't think this, that's a lot to build on. Um, so so another, another way of putting the point is if fear, if fear of death is your only basis for us cooperating with each other in politics, you're kind of doomed unless you start a perpetual war with some you know, mutual enemy that we're constantly afraid of killing us, much as what worked in the Cold War, right, to cultivate bipartisan consensus on a lot of policy. We're all worried about the Soviets nuking us, and that was actually really helpful. Scary as hell, but really helpful. Uh, I, I don't think you're going to generate the same kind of long-lasting fear out of pandemic worries, because this is going to go away if we're lucky in the next year or so. Uh, but I, I do worry in the absence of a common threat, either of, of disease, natural disasters, or war, or China, um, what, what can be the basis of our shared political identity and our cooperation? Uh, we're very far apart as a country right now. And, and I really worry about what that means for public health and for everything else we try and do together. Yeah, because public health is, um, it, it really is the way that we are all connected. And public health does bring us together and in, in, in some way you would think that maybe this pandemic would help unite us but it seems it's done the opposite well and, and there's research that shows in previous outbreaks that uh outbreaks do not overcome committed vaccine refusal and in fact they reinforce people's existing vaccine refusal the people on the fence who are wavering a little bit, you know, outbreak and that bit of fear can be enough to bunch them off the fence. But people whose identities are already wrapped up in rejecting vaccines or rejecting masks or rejecting social distancing, or uh, it's uh, the fear is not going to be enough, right? In fact, it, it largely, as you suggest, entrenches them in their existing commitments. So I know you don't have a crystal ball, but yeah. um, let's say, okay, we get the vaccine and it's starting to be widely available. Because now we're even seeing issues with testing and the shortage of testing supplies once again. Yeah. But also it's the accuracy uh, of some of these tests and the uncertainty surrounding this pandemic that is adding, I think, to the confusion of the discussion. But what does an employee or an employer face in the future? Is it going to be pretty common that we're going to have to have a vaccination and show proof of that vaccination in order to do so many things that we do right now. Well, I think you're yeah. pre pre pandemic. I think there's a lot of uncertainty and, and it'll, so the short answer is it depends, but I think it's unlikely. Uh, and, and here's why, um, you know, the seasonal flu kills tens of thousands of people uh, every year, even with vaccines. Uh, and and as it is, though, only some employers, right, like uh, uh, healthcare uh, employers, require the employees to get that vaccine. I, search, I strongly suspect that with widespread COVID vaccination, we're going to see death rates of COVID that start to get close to seasonal influenza, uh, which is to say it's a similar kind of risk. And given, given the similar kind of risk, if they're going to be mandates, I think they're going to be really narrowly targeted at those with at-risk populations. So people working with incarcerated persons, right, with kids in group homes, right, in hospitals. But, but that's, that's a big guess. If, if we continue to see 100,000 people a year die of this disease, then I think it's possible that more employers are going to have mandates. Um, I, I think that's unlikely, though. But, but here's another thing to consider. Um, the recent move on the Supreme Court uh, and, and in the existing uh, 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 government has been to expand conscience protections, especially for people who make religious objections. And so the Office of Civil Rights uh, has dramatically, since 2017, dramatically expanded the rights of healthcare workers to refuse participating in interventions to which they have re religious objections. And, and it applies to basically everything they do on the job and basically all healthcare workers, from surgeons to janitorial staff. And so I strongly suspect that any new mandates are going to come with very expansive religious exemption provisions, which undercuts their ability to really be mandates. So first off, I don't think we're going to need the mandates as broad based. But second, if we tried, I worry that the, the recent movement towards more expansive religious liberty rights uh, is going to undercut their power anyway. Mark Navin with us. He is a professor and the chair of philosophy at Oakland University and a lecturer in the foundational medical studies at the Oakland University. William Beaumont School of Medicine joining us on the Oakland County Megacast. And Mark, for, for many of those that are out there that 
will not get the vaccine or refuse to get the vaccine. They're making an argument that is very commonly seen in other in other bodily health arguments such as reproductive health and in uh, abortion and in a number of other health issues. Uh, it's my body. It's my choice. I choose not to get the vaccine. The whole point of the vaccine is to get enough of the, pa of the population to be theoretically Im immune or not in a deadly position from the virus so that it's not necessarily a huge a huge issue. So for those that are going to claim my body, my choice, I don't think I need this vaccine, I don't want this vaccine, whether it's a religious reason or not, what can be done at that point to talk to them about the importance of this vaccine? Or are they at that point, because of the whole point of the vaccine, in a sort of a clearer position where they can make that choice and it's just a matter of a certain po percentage of the population needs to not make that choice in order for this to be ethical. It's a really nice point and, and, and I wanna make sort of two responses that maybe aren't on point and, and maybe push me some more. So the yeah. first is that there's a, an important distinction between uh, clinical ethics, the sort of ethics of agreeing to healthcare treatments, which should prioritize informed consent Right, that it's my body and I get to decide whether you're going to do surgery on it or not, whether you're going to start chemo and whether I'm ready for hospice. Right, That's clinical ethics and, and informed consent is primary. In public health ethics, where we're talking about risks to others and to the community, especially risks that I could impose on others by infecting them, then it's not only my liberty that matters. Uh, now, how to balance my liberty against protecting the community, that's the central problem of public health ethics. But I think that distinction is, is fundamental to keep in mind. And relatedly, I think it's worth considering that all of the laws, all the major laws and policies we have on the books for vaccines, everything from the Supreme Court jurisprudence of the early 20th century to the current sort of school requirements of the 1960s and 1970s, um, those all were written before informed consent became an institutionalized part of our medical care in the 1970s and 1980s. We sometimes forget like how new the idea is that patients get to call their shots when it comes to medical treatment. And you're entirely right that there's a conflict set up between that rise of, the, of, of patient freedom in the 1970s and 1980s and the public health orientation of our laws and policies around immunizations. And, and people that take for granted that that's an easy circle to square aren't paying attention, I think, to the kind of tensions that, that you're, you're identifying. And the short story is we as a culture in America are struggling to commit ourselves to a conception of freedom that protects us from the kinds of oppression our political culture is based on, but also allows us the kind of freedom to live a life together peacefully and healthily. Like, I'm glad that people have freedom to reject medical interventions, sure, but I would like the freedom to go to restaurants and the freedom to send my kids to school and the freedom for people to go to church and the freedom to do all kinds of things we can't do because people are not responsibly making their choices. But we as a culture are struggling with what freedom means. Uh, especially the kind of freedom that matters. Yeah, we're fortunate enough to live in a country where we can make those choices for ourselves, for our families, but choices do have con have consequences, and you want to make sure you're making an informed choice. So for those that are refusing a vaccine or just simply don't want to have that conversation, you talked earlier about an inform about information campaigns, about about the misinformation or disinformation about vaccines that may be out there. Where does that start, even if ultimately, you're not going to convince some people because that's just the nature of the freedom of choice that we have in this country. So I, look, um, I, by information campaigns, we could mean a couple different things. And I think both are really important. So one, where you're just doing general information about what the vaccine is and how it works and it's very low risks of complications, that's super important. The other kind that, that actually can move people is when you, you uh, present people with examples of people like them that are making the choice you want them to make. Because everyone is pro-science. Everyone follows experts. We just disagree about who the experts are that we should follow. And so what we see in, in successful targeted public health messaging is that you want to invoke uh, the, the authority of leaders and spokespeople from people's own community. So for one example, in 2019, we had a measles outbreak in New York that spread to Southeast Michigan. And the, the Southeast Michigan local health departments did an amazing job of reaching out to Orthodox Jewish community leaders and the sort of council of, of Orthodox rabbis and to sort of work and partner with them uh, to communicate to the people the importance of getting this vaccine. Um, Oakland County Health Division gave out 2000 doses of the MMR vaccine in a matter of a couple weeks which far surpasses the normal, uh, and it was almost all because of the cooperation of, of Orthodox rabbis. So I think 
public health is not public health's work in this sort of information is not just facts and figures, but it's about convincing people that people like them are on board because that's how we get persuaded. We are tribal, you know, monkey brain kind of people who largely want to do what people like us are doing. And, and if you can if you can pick that up by the right handle, then you can change some minds. Yeah, it's it's amazing to watch how this, in some regards, is reaching up, teaching us that we've got to expand our circles and reach out to individuals and how much public perception really plays into this. From someone with your, um, your education and your experience, what are your thoughts about watching how the pandemic is playing out in other countries, such as China, um, where maybe they don't have the same public rights and the same public discussions that we're all having here in America, they're saying now it's pretty much contained in China. Well, and, and I mean, every country is different. So you're right. I, I wouldn't want to be in a China. Uh, but but even, um, you know, Taiwan has things well under control. New Zealand has what, things well under control. Now, both those are island countries. So it's easy to, to uh, control people who are coming and going. Uh, South Korea has had mixed success. Uh, but but you're right. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know what the right answer is. We How to put this? In philosophy, we sometimes have sort of utopian ideas, like what if you could remake the world? Let me write a book about like how the world would be great. But that's not that's what politics is. You go to politics with the people you have, and the people you have have the values and the commitments they have. Uh, and in democratic politics, you you do politics based on the agreement you can get out of majorities. And while I would like to believe everyone shared my values, they don't. And in fact, I know that many of my ideas are, are minority views. And so the question is, given the sort of majority conception people have about liberty and distrust of government, uh, how do we build a sense of responsibility around public health? Uh, I think that's look that that is connected to the biggest question of our time because it's it's also connected to questions about climate change uh, and rebuilding our infrastructure and I got damn roads in Michigan. Uh, I mean that's that's the question, right? So we care about this freedom and we're skeptical of government, but how can we build the stuff we need so we can go on living together? I wish I knew, but the shorter answer is you can't make me king. Uh, because I don't share the values of everybody else. How can we get people in those kind of communities uh, who do care about this stuff uh, to have those difficult conversations? Uh, and a lot of that, though, I, I believe is shaped around public perception. And if you can change public perception, you can change the thoughts and the ideals and the implications of so many of these issues. Uh, Mark Navin with us here on the Oakland County Megacast. He's a professor and chair of philosophy at the Oakland University and lecturer and uh, medical studies at the Oakland University, William Beaumont. Before we let you go, this is a fascinating conversation to me. Uh, well, thanks, because, Ronnie. I'm having fun too. I will say, I think, I think the ethics surrounding COVID-19 and this pandemic it, it, it's sparking so many new conversations that maybe we didn't have before. And it's also bringing issue to the forefront that needs to be addressed. And knowing that, and what do you think is going to be the silver lining coming out of this pandemic? Because let's hope we've all learned something at the end. I get what you're going for. And, do, you and think, I, do you think there's going to be a silver lining? Let's just say no, that. <laughs> no, I don't. I think there's going to be 300, 400, 500,000 dead people. There's going to be millions of people who have lifelong uh, morbidities associated with this, this disease. I don't think it's going to lead to resolution in some of our institutional failures. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not optimistic at all. I, I hope, of course, that widespread distribution of the vaccine is going to save lives and prevent people from having lifelong morbidities. I, I'm hopeful that, that some of our governors are going to come around on mask mandates. I'm hopeful we can overcome worries about uh, acceptance of the vaccine. But I think it's mostly for the bad for a long time. Here's one example. There's so many things we're not paying attention to. You in the previous segment talking about women exiting the workforce. Mm -hmm. That has decades long and even generational consequences. Right. For family wealth, for family and children's educational opportunities that that is we're not going to solve that problem. That problem is done. Here's another huge problem. Uh, there's been a dramatic drop off in well baby visits and routine childhood vac vaccinations. We're likely to see measles outbreaks um, right associated with this for years to come. People are off the schedule. Uh, there are all kinds of negative things coming. I, I wish I, I had a silver lining. The silver lining is maybe as of December 11th, 
the Pfizer vaccine can start getting out there. Maybe the bad can start getting a little better. Uh, I Maybe, I don't know, do you see a silver lining? Because I, I wish I could find one. Uh, well, I think there are some things. And one being number one is, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we started as a society having bigger discussions about the inequities of healthcare and its accessibility within minority communities. So maybe hopefully that's going to shift going forward. It, it, it's not, and, and I know that as Americans, we typically have a very short attention span, but maybe that opened the door for studies and conversations down the road so that we can make the community a better place at the end of this line. Those little things I hope, or and, and, and just the general things in that it's brought us together closer with our families and our, you know, what really matters. Do I wish that I wish that were true. I, I got to tell you, I keep hearing stories from friends and acquaintances that this has divided their families, that yeah. that that people are, are refusing to go to Thanksgiving uh, when it's being hosted with large groups and the people who are refusing to go, they're blowing up their families. Uh, I, I think masks, you responded. I, I'm sorry you're trying to end on a good note and I apologize for this, but I, I actually think it's worse than, than this. <laughs> But, 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 you know, I'm a philosopher and, and my job is to think critically. And sometimes that means that I'm hypercritical. So I hope that I'm wrong and I hope there are some silver linings here. And I would be very glad if you ever had me back to, uh, to eat crow for everything I got wrong. Well, we, we would love that. But we would also love to have you back anytime yes. because your education and your experience and your expertise is invaluable to the community and sharing that. Um, we appreciate that, especially because the, the conversation around the vaccine I think in the next six months is only going to continue to grow because we are going to start to see some of these issues really arise. Do I, you know, Ticketmaster, I need a vaccine to go to a concert, um, schools, employment. And while it's been pretty standard, like you were mentioning in some of the healthcare industries, uh, what's that going to be like if I work at a local restaurant? Who's going to pay for it? Who's liable? This, that, and the other. But we've also seen, like you said, we've had vaccines around the flu for years, but people are still dying of the flu. So what happens if you get a vaccine and you still continue to spread? How's that going to work? And I think there's so much going forward in the next six months, this conversation around the vaccine and the ethics of the vaccine with doctors and schools and employers, it's going to have a direct impact. I think the conversation is going to shift that way. So it'd be great to have you on and your expertise as well. And and thank you for sharing your uh, knowledge with us. Well, thanks for having me join you today. It was great. Anything quickly before we let you go, anything? Uh, I was trying to leave you on a positive note, but you're well, sorry. <laughs> but anything else maybe I didn't touch upon that you uh, want to want people to know? Well, so just this, if you've got kids, please keep them on the schedule. Please get those routine vaccines. Uh, your pediatrician can find safe ways, even in the midst of the height of the pandemic, can find safe ways to get your kids their regular vaccines. We need to keep that going. Yeah, and we have had conversations with other doctors who are stressing that same thing. So thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. And again, uh, a safe and a happy yet small Thanksgiving, uh, small Thanksgiving celebration to you and your family. And to you too. Thank you.